Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Paula Fontana, Vice President of Strategic Programming Initiatives with the National Black MBA Association, and welcome to Health and Wellness Matters in the Black Community. So what I absolutely love about tonight's event is that this is an example of the benefits of membership in our association. So you'll not only get incredible year-round programming, but also a peek into the benefit of joining one of our 40 chapters throughout the US for local support as you navigate your career. So our host for this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing him. He is the president of our DC chapter, Lamar White. So his background is way too impressive and massive to list everything, but here are a few highlights. He is a native of Barbados, he holds several degrees, including a doctor of education degree. So he is in fact, Dr. White. Dr. White manages global, Google's global anti-bribery due diligence program by day. And then by night, he literally turns into Superman. So because of his passion for education and love for teaching, he teaches at the college and university level. And then his love for community has him serving on several boards as well as being a sought after speaker. Please join me in welcoming Lamar White. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Paula, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our series. Um, every administration has something unique that they bring to the organization. And for my second term uh, as a president of the DC chapter, I wanted to bring the I Have a Dream speaker series to our members. And what this is, is just, we all dream about different things in our lives and the DC chapter wants to bring you that information to make that dream a reality. Uh, it's a six part series. Uh, the, the areas that we're gonna be focusing on are invest in, home ownership, travel, leisure, retirement, estate planning, and health and wellness. And so this evening, we're gonna be kicking off our health and wellness, I have a dream speaker series with Dr. Bissell. So Anton C. Bissell, MD, is a physician entrepreneur, change leader and CEO of the Bissell Group, LLC, a strategy consulting and technology firm that delivers data-driven research informed innovative solutions to the world's most complex health, economic, security, and sustainability challenges. Driven by a passion to improve lives, Bissell has evolved to lead the way in some of the most exciting and critical issues of our time, including training of health providers, tackling the Ebola epidemic in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, creating new ways to reach US military members at risk of suicide and promoting and securing global health. Under Dr. Bassell's strategic direction, Bassell continues to be recognized for growth, achievement and job creation and has expanded from a staff of two in one small office to a thriving firm with four offices in Lanham and Rockville, Maryland, Atlanta, Georgia and Goma Democratic Republic of the Congo with ongoing projects around the world. One of the fastest growing companies in America, Bissell continues to rank on INC Magazine's top 5,000 list for 2020. Bissell was named to the 75 fastest growing companies of 2018 and 2019 by the Washington Business Journal. Bissell has also been named a finalist in the 2020 US Chamber of Commerce Dream Big Awards exemplifying success and leadership in each of the following areas, business growth and performance, business strategies and goals, community engagement, customer and employee relation practices, and innovative business strategies and practices. The US Small Business Administration selected Dr. Bissell as Maryland's Small Business Person of the Year 2020. Congratulations on that. Dr. Bissell has more than 25 years of combined clinical research, health services, policy, and management experiences with private and public organizations and agencies within the US Department of Health and Human Services, including serving as a medical officer 
for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the National Institutes of Health. He received his BA in biology from the University of Virginia, his MD from the University of Virginia School of Medicine, and his postgraduate training in family medicine from Howard University Hospital in Washington, DC. Ladies and gentlemen, to kick off our I Have a Dream series with health and wellness in the black community, Dr. Bissell. Thank you, uh, Lamar, and also thank you, Paula, for the wonderful invitation. Um, as we share in this I Have a Dream series, um, I just want to first thank each and every one for allowing me to come before you today. Um, when I think about um, dreams, I sort of like go back to the theme that I know. Uh, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. It was those that we stand on, those shoulders that we stand on is really the reason why we're here. Whether you're an MD or you have your master's in business administration, or if you have other degrees, it's because of someone's shoulder that we are standing on. And so we just have to like, just pause and thank each and everyone who stood behind us and was that wind beneath our wings to get us to where we are. Now, today we're going to talk about something that is so near and dear to me, as well as to so many of us, and that's really around health and wellness. Without um, a healthy and a wellness um, aspect in your life, we're gonna be faced with so many other issues um, in our lives. And so today, I just wanna share with you a little bit um, about what we're faced with as far as people of color and African-Americans when it comes to health. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna open this up at the end um, and maybe in between to really um, have a few questions. So when we really think about um, what life is like for African-Americans now, we are starting to live longer. The death rate for African-Americans has declined about 25% over 17 years, uh, primarily uh, for those who are age 65 and older. But what we're starting to see is our younger folks are starting to live longer. And it's not just for African-Americans, but it's also for the American population um, in its to totality. Now, even with these new improvements, uh, we're seeing that some studies are showing that the younger African-Americans are living longer with or dying with many conditions that are not normally found in white Americans at older age. Uh, of course, we know the prostate cancer, we know heart disease, diabetes, all of those. But I know individuals who have, let's say, um, you know, other issues that are really um, used to be in the white community. And so when we think about those things, we have to really think about what's happening. Um, the differences show up really in African-Americans in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s. And the causes of death are tremendous. Now, when we look at the top 10 health issues in the African-American community, there are several things that we have to think about. Heart disease, cancers, accidents, and really this is unintentional injuries. Uh, stroke or cerebral vascular disease, diabetes, chronic uh, lower respiratory diseases, assault and homicide, uh, nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, and other kidney diseases, Alzheimer's disease, and septicemia or infection. But when we look at really what's killing us, we see around 23.3% are the diseases of the heart, and then of cancer, 20%, accidents, stroke, diabetes. What is the underlying issue with that that's in our social life or, uh, or that side of our lives that we have to really look at? Exercise, diet, family history, all of those things as well. Smoking, drinking, all of those really contribute to those top two. When you throw in accidents, you got the car accidents, again, under the influence or just other things that are going on. Stroke, again, what are we looking at? You got high blood pressure, you got uh, bleeding and all those types of things that can occur. Smoking is um, you know, one of the um, preconditions of someone possibly having stroke. So really when we look at it, what are we putting in our bodies? 
if we're going to have a dream of a future, we have to really be mindful of the things that we're actually putting into our bodies. And so those are, again, the causes of death uh, within our communities. And so really, when we see this, um, we have to really talk about what are the social determinants of health? These are the conditions and environment where people are born, where they live, where they work, where they play, where they worship, and the age that really affect a wide range of health functioning and the quality of life outcomes and the risk. We look at those social determinants of health and we all really know them into five domains, healthcare access and quality, your know, neighborhoods and uh, the environment as well, social and community context, economic stability, education and access to quality. So really, let's look at that. Healthcare and access to uh, and quality. We as a people, I recall um, listening to my grandparents, a lot of times they could not even go to hospitals. If we really look at the late 60s or even less or even the late 50s and early 60s, I recall my grandmother talking about having to deliver um, her third child, but she went to the hospital and she couldn't be seen and taken care of. Now, the sad part about it, she ended up going to work for years later for the physician who refused to care for her. These are the stories that we hear. These are the stories that propel us to want to do even more in the future. The neighborhoods we live in, why is it that we walk through or drive through Baltimore or Detroit or other places and there it's a food desert? And not only a food desert, it's a pharmacy desert or there are not enough bike lanes. Those are the things that we have to think about our neighborhoods because if we can deal with those social determinants of health, then we can get our lives back and look at those things that are causing disease. Social and community context. When I go home, I, you know, um, I'm from New Bern, North Carolina, this place called James City outside of there. I swear if I go back to my neighborhood and I go to this one tree right by the corner store, you're gonna find about 15 people that are standing there drinking. You go back 10 years later, they're gonna still be there drinking. What is the social and the community context we have to think about when we're looking at disease? Economic stability. Right now, we're going through some major economic downturns in our country, um, and we're gonna talk about COVID-19 uh, a little bit later, but we also have to look at what's really going on right now that's really affecting us. Education, access, and quality. Are we getting the access to um, education and those things that will allow us to have excellent health? So when we look at this again, we have to look at, at this in this standpoint. Social determinants of health have a major impact on people's health, well-being, and quality of life. And examples include safe housing and transportation, as we mentioned. Uh, racism, discrimination, and violence, education, job opportunities, and income, access to nutritious foods and physical activity opportunities, polluted air and water, and language and literacy skills. So when we also look at this, uh, we see that they contribute to wide health disparities and inequities. People who don't have access to grocery stores with healthy food are less likely to have good nutrition. That raises the risk of health conditions like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and even lowers the health expectancy relative to people who do not have access to healthy food. And just promoting healthy choices won't eliminate these um, other um, health disparities, but we need, to, in the medical field, we need to partner up with the National Black MBA Association as well as others to really look at how can we improve those sectors within our society, such as education and transportation and housing needs to really improve the conditions in everyone's economy and environment. So let's look at some of the stats that we see um, here. Uh, we see that, um, and you'll see that the red uh, bar or burgundy bar is African-Americans and the teal blue is uh, white Americans. African Americans are more likely to die at early ages of all causes. And if we look at this, we see 
um, everything here. Um, and I'll go into some details of what those uh, represent as well in the next slide. So here we go, high blood pressure. If you're between the ages of eight and 34, you see that African-Americans actually have more high blood pressure than our white Americans. We go up to even the 35 to 49, we see um, more, um, again, a rising number of African-Americans that are having high blood pressure. And 50 to 64, I barely made that. But again, somewhere around the age of 49, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. And again, around a 20% um, uh, greater percentage than our white Americans that have high blood pressure between ages of 50 and 64. But let's look at diabetes. We start off 18 to 34. You can almost say, you know, uh, diabetes or what we used to call uh, juvenile onset diabetes, pretty much equal, 1.5 to 1.4. But then we see diabetes jump between the ages of 35 and 49 as compared to 6% of our white counterparts. What's the biggest thing behind diabetes? Obesity. Now, again, you have issues, you know, with pancreas and all those other things. But let me tell you, it really comes down to um, our physical activity and our um, um, uh, having to deal with um, overweight and diabetes. If you know someone that um, is pre-diabetic as what we may say, and they go and they start exercising and they lose weight um, and they start eating better, chances are their diabetes conditions may improve and is likely to improve. Now, when you look at that 50 to 64 um, age range again, you see almost a 10% difference um, in the ages. And let's look at stroke. Uh, still 0.7% to 0.4%, but then we're 2% to 1%. But when we get to the ages, again, 50 to 64, we're seeing that more um, African-Americans, again, are suffering from stroke. So these are the things that we really have to look at. So when we go back to talking about uh, those social determinants of health, um, if we look at this again, compare uh, where we are in the um, maroon and where in the teal blue the um, white Americans are. Unemployment, again, we have higher unemployment. We're living in poverty. No home ownership. Could not see a doctor. Smoking, again, in the higher range, we're higher. Less physical activity or not active. Here we go again, and obesity. These are the numbers that we have to really look at because these are the risk factors that really affect us at a younger age. And if we begin to tackle this um, at, a, at, a, um, at our younger age and really addressing this, we can really make a difference. We have to think about what about physical activity in our school systems? We've gone through a time period where we took PE out of the schools. And you know, what do we see? we saw a rise in childhood obesity. And these are the things that we're faced with. Right now, we do know in this COVID environment, kids are less active. They're not in school and they're not running around on the playground. We have to you know, go outside and social distance. We have to mask and all these things. These are the things that we have to think about because 10 and 20 years down the road, we may be faced with the same thing. And I typically say that uh, diseases typically wax and wane uh, for the most part, depending on what else is going on. Now, when we look at this since 1999, and again, the data tends to be a little slow when we're dealing with this, sometimes uh, two to three years. But this was, um, we looked at this from um, really over a 16 year perspective. And you see um, around heart disease uh, where we are. And this again is the leading causes of death for African Americans. Um, and it has decreased, if you see that. Um, again, stroke is decreasing, cancer is decreasing, and heart disease is actually decreasing at a faster rate. We're becoming more physically active. Um, even now, we're being educated even more. Um, you have the internet that came into play. Folks actually have um, better access to their health information. We now have um, medical devices that are integrated into our electronic health records so that if you're uh, getting a blood pressure, it goes into your chart. 
And it's not just your doctor looking at it, but as many others that are looking at it. So again, we have to look at this from a holistic standpoint. Now, according to CDC, life expectancy in the U.S. declined by one full year in the first half of 2020 to 77.8. And that's down 78 uh, from 78.8 years in 2019. And this is something that we're going to cover shortly in dealing with COVID-19 because we are seeing already that we're dying at two thirds the time of, of, of others, or about 60 to 70 percent. And it's even higher in some cities, depending on where you are and what those social determinants of health. And like this sign says, my skin shouldn't be a death sentence, not just with COVID, but with so many other things as well. So I just wanted to touch, uh, we're gonna we'll open the floor up a little bit later. I just wanna be mindful of the time. Um, and I want to talk about COVID-19 because this is what's killing us at faster rates now. Um, we are, as you see overall, even in the United States, we saw a 1% um, or a whole year taking off our life. Imagine what that is in the Black and Latinx communities. So this has really um, revealed some uh, deep-seated inequities in healthcare for our communities of color. Um, and it really amplified the social and economic factors that contribute to poor health outcomes. And so recent news reports indicate that the pandemic disproportionately impacts communities of color, compounding longstanding racial disparities. And to be honest, we didn't really need the newspapers to tell us that. We already knew that. People of color, they're at an increased risk for serious illness if they contract COVID-19 due to higher rates of underlying health conditions such as diabetes, asthma, which was respiratory disease we saw, hypertension, and obesity compared to whites. We all have heard the stories. Uh, we're seeing where our folks who have these diseases are actually some of the ones who are needing to go on the vents and then there are also the ones that we are losing at faster rates than others. Now, I'm gonna just say we have to do more research because to determine if there's something that's related to that. But what we do know is this, it's the underlying health conditions within our people that's very poor. And so we're having uh, worse outcomes when it comes to COVID-19 in the black communities. Um, more importantly, more likely to be uninsured and to lack a usual source of care, which is an impediment to assessing, accessing COVID-19 testing and treatment services. If we really look at this right now, um, you know, I, I'm living in the Washington DC area. Um, I go to Baltimore quite, quite a bit. Um, I'm in a fraternity that I'm in the chapter in Baltimore. And um, one of my um, younger frat brothers just told me last week, he went to the Baltimore Convention Center to get his COVID-19 vaccination. And to his astonishment, there were no black people there or very few. What he did, he actually took out his phone and took a video just to prove it. Now we're in the middle of Baltimore. I also don't live too far in the Maryland area from this place called Largo. Largo, I got another call that said, uh, they went to the Largo, from another friend, they went to the Largo CVS. The only people they saw standing in line were white Americans. But I go to CVS all the time. I've never seen a white American in, C in the CVS in Largo. What's going on with our people? I know that there's some mistrust. I know that they feel that the vaccine was uh, made too quickly. But we also go back to Tuskegee and we think about um, everything that occurred there and the injustices that occurred as a result of the Tuskegee syphilis study. But I also want to say that, yes, that was a conspiracy, but I think there's a greater conspiracy that's here that's facing our people. And the conspiracy is this, they know we're not gonna get, go and get vaccines. If we're gonna ever reach herd immunity within our community, and that's where the 60 or 70%, we really need to get there so that we can sort of like get our lives back together. And I'll go into some more details about why um, we want to do that. Um, and that's one, because if we vaccinate more people, 
that means that there, as far as the variants that are out there, if you vaccinate people and there's less of COVID-19 in society and in your communities, that means there's less variants that will come. That's one of the reasons why you're gonna see um, this rapid um, plan to try to get um, many people vaccinated really by the end of July and probably by the end of June. Just recently last week, um, President Biden announced that they were, the US is purchasing 600 million vaccines so that we can be treated. Um, and there's a reason why we need to be mindful of that. And I just say, if we as a black people do not go and get vaccinated, we're gonna continue to die at the same rate or if not higher. So we have to be those advocates within our communities to ensure that our folks are getting uh, the vaccines. Now, of course we know um, the service areas that we typically will work in um, are restaurants, retail, hospitality, and they're particularly at the risk of a loss of income. We're having to stay home to take care of our kids because they're not in school. We, we have lost our jobs. Restaurants are not open. The hospitality industry is suffering. Um, so really, what do we have to do? We haven't gotten our second stimulus checks. You know, all those types of things. What, why are we in this position? And we have to, again, what are those social determinants of health? We're more likely to live in housing situations such as multi-generational families or low income or public housing that make it difficult to social distance or self-isolate. So those are the things that we have to really think about and often working in jobs that are not amenable to teleworking or using public transportation that puts them at risk for exposure to COVID-19. And when we saw our economy or our um, job, um, job started to open back up, of course, the first jobs that were opening back up, restaurants and retail and some other areas, uh, public transportation, because we had to get people back to work. And so this is what we have right now. And so what I would like to do also, um, and I'll open it up, and what I'll do is I will um, stop sharing and we'll take some questions because what I want to do is really to talk about uh, COVID-19 and what we're seeing. So with COVID-19, uh, we know that uh, we're dealing with uh, COVID-19, which, which is a respiratory virus uh, that we're seeing, um, and it has been mutating uh, quite a bit. There's a UK variant. There's also a South African variant. Um, I recall sitting in a meeting that we put on for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, February 26th of last year. We had about 2,800 persons in that convention center that our company put on. And I remember seeing the numbers that CDC presented back in February. And mind you, remember, we did not have a declaration for a pandemic until March 13th. I saw the hundreds of thousands of folks that were going to die, that were predicted to die. We've gone well above what the predictions were. So when we think about where we are as a nation, we have to really think about what is that we can do to really think about how best to um, combat this. So what I would like to say is we have the technology that has been really around for more than two decades, more than, um, um, more than 20 years. And we hear the stories of, you know, the black female that uh, worked on the team with uh, Dr. Um, Graham at NIH or the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease. And when we think of um, vaccines in its traditional way, a lot of us had, um, whether you had polio shots, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, hepatitis, and all those things, those things are important to know that those were live or attenuated uh, viruses that contained the live virus or a dead virus. What this new technology has done over the past few years and decades is really dealing with messenger RNA or spike protein and it's not even the actual virus, what it is are is particles of it or the coating of it. So when it is given to your body as a vaccine, it goes into your body and a response is recognized. For instance, uh, you get the vaccines in and your body responds as if it is the disease, but it's not really the disease. So your body will then have what's called messenger RNA so that the next time you're exposed to it, 
your body begins to fight it much faster and it will recognize that. And that's where that messenger piece comes in and your body will kick in antibodies. So one of the things we got to think about when it comes to uh, COVID-19 is we just have to educate our folks that yes, um, and as you know, we were, we, we were chatting before this, we're seeing it on that second dose that there are some folks that are seeing more side effects. You're gonna get the nausea, the vomiting, you'll get a, a, a fever and a headache. You'll get those things or really the pain at the injection site. That's really the biggest piece, the pain at the injection site. On your second dose, what we're seeing is you're seeing some of those symptoms that will show up. And what that is saying is that your body is just really recognizing that uh, and is really fighting and is working and that the vaccine is working is what we like to say. So when we look at Moderna versus uh, Pfizer, we know that Pfizer is 95% effective and Moderna is 94.1% effective. When we see, and that's with two doses, when we see what the effect is uh, with just one dose, we see between 72 to 82% that's effective. But you go back and you get that booster and with that booster, you then um, kick it up to 95, 94 to 95%. Some people say, if I've had COVID-19 before, should I get the vaccine? And yes, you should. Because what happens is, consider it almost like a booster, but what we don't know is this, um, whether it will last three months or longer, whether it will last a year, we don't know. But what we're seeing is that we're, te we're looking at it in the hundreds of thousands of folks that are being vaccinated. We'll say, well, we didn't have enough African-Americans in the studies. And I do agree because we're seeing some of the studies had 9% African-Americans and we make up 13%. I'm like, okay, that's fine and good. It's close to the 13%. But when you look at the numbers that are affected, we really should have had somewhere around 20 to 30% in the studies. But I'll say this, what we're now seeing are the numbers of the folks that have been vaccinated and we're gonna get more reports down the road. The other things to think about when it comes to uh, vaccines. So again, um, if you have had COVID, go get the vaccine. If you are immunocompromised, if you have uh, on chemotherapy, you want to get this because what we want to do is to ward off any kind of things that will come in to um, um, have any kind of morbidity or mortality um, in our lives when it comes to COVID-19. Um, the other things to think about, again, breastfeeding. Um, we've, so, we've seen um, and the studies um, and what CDC says that um, if you are breastfeeding, it really is okay. But I say, go see your primary care doctor, talk to them and then talk with them about it. Um, and also, um, you know, I get this, asked this question a lot. Is, it gonna, is the vaccine gonna affect my fertility? What we're seeing is again, no. So again, if you're above certain age, whether 75 or 65 in some states, some states are different, get the vaccine and uh, definitely uh, we can um, uh, deal with that. So what I'm gonna do is um, actually uh, work with Lamar and, um, and we will definitely answer any of the questions that you may have at this time. Sure. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, the first question we have, uh, which I think you may have addressed a little bit, but what about the people that are having deaths, adverse reactions, and still getting sick after getting the vaccine? Are we being told the whole truth about it? Yes, we're really being told the truth about it. Again, that second vaccine, and I'm gonna just say this, um, I go get my second vaccine at 8.50 in the morning this coming Sunday. And I will go there. I'm going to take Tylenol before I go uh, because I know that most people that get that second vaccine will have those um, chills, those muscle aches, you know, the headaches and just feeling blah. So we always say definitely, um, I say definitely you're going to treat the symptoms. Uh, but again, that's a sign that is actually working. So uh, definitely that. Uh, so the side effects. Now, if there are some real adverse side effects, if you have allergies to certain things, you have to be mindful of that. But for the most part, um, um, it's best to have those symptoms than to be in an ICU. All right. Thank you for that. The other question, if you know, how has the vaccine 
availability and adoption been in the Congo? Oh yeah, I'm glad you asked. Um, we actually have um, two offices in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And we were there, we've been there now for two years trying to fight Ebola. I have about maybe 12 people there that's on the ground, maybe a little bit more. Um, it's it's uh, interesting because Ebola is deadly. Um, as you see, and you've seen the, um, and you, the, they come with the suits and even just touching dead bodies, you can actually get uh, sick and, um, and die. But with, they were more afraid of COVID um, in the Congo. Um, and the good thing was we had people on the ground already and the same things we were doing with the contact tracing for Ebola worked really well for this. Now, what we're going to, what I'm going to say is this, we have Johnson & Johnson and we also have AstraZeneca um, that will probably have an emergency use authorization uh, coming before the FDA soon. And then we have CDC to um, convene their panels to make the recommendations for the nation. Um, um, I'm going to say this. The Wall Street Journal came out with a news article last week that said there are going to be some parts of the world that will not receive vaccinations until the end of 2022. Now, what does that tell you? We have to make sure right now with, um, with Pfizer and Moderna, you have to keep that at either sub-zero temperatures or right around it. If you're like me, I don't have a sub-zero uh, temperature uh, freezer in my house. Can you imagine being in the Congo with sub-zero um, freezers? And then you have to think about that. So what we're looking for and hoping for is that one dose of, let's say, Johnson & Johnson that doesn't need to be refrigerated and we go and take it to parts of the world. We're still trying to get high blood pressure medicine to parts of uh, the Congo and other places. We're using uh, drones to get medication to certain um, hard to reach places. I've seen even where Coca-Cola is uh, being utilized to get medicines to hard to reach populations. So can you imagine getting COVID vaccines in those hard to reach populations? That's where we as, again, African-Americans in the US, whether we're part of the National Black MBA Association and others to help educate and to help advocate for folks um, as well. So since you touched on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I'll jump to that question. And, and this individual asked, what about the Johnson & Johnson one-shot dose? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think we need as much of the vaccines on the street as possible. Now, as far as being effective, now the numbers are coming back a little bit lower than Moderna and uh, Pfizer. But the thing is right now, and I gave you sort of like the cons of Pfizer and Moderna, but I think it's gonna be very effective in those hard to reach places um, and a lot of the places that have people that look like us. So again, what we're saying is this, whatever vaccine, whatever vaccine you get, um, we have to get it. I was just on a program uh, with um, Dr. Fauci just yesterday and Dr. Graham, who is the director of the uh, virology lab at NIH. And we also say whatever vaccine you can get to get it. And I'm going to just say we need to really um, um, don't be on the fence, but really think about getting it sooner or later. And this is the other thing I say as well. We're worried about um, a vaccine um, that's not going to change our DNA. So that's the one thing. It's not going to change our cells. It's not going to do that. Um, because it's a different mechanism, but we're also putting the fried chicken in our bodies. Uh, we're eating the, uh, if you like me, I like pork barbecue. Um, we do hookah. We do, we smoke other stuff. We drink alcohol and those things actually can alter us too. Because those things can actually cause us as we started out, the diabetes, the heart problems and all those things. So we have to really think about what is it that we're causing to ourselves? And again, I know it's, I know it's scary. Um, and I know we just came through what was called warp speed. Um, but again, it shouldn't have been called warp speed because we've been looking at this technology for 20 years. Um, the Ebola vaccine was um, something that was very similar to this. Um, and we dealt with even HIV AIDS um, as well. So again, don't be afraid of it. Um, and you can always reach out to me if you want any information, but CDC is a very good uh, place for us. 
And, um, and one of the things that you may want to do with the Black uh, National Black MBA Association is link up with the National Association of Chain Drug Stores. Um, and they're also reaching out to our communities. And I'll be glad to share uh, that information with uh, one of their senior leaders as well, because they want to make sure that we're getting the message out to our communities. Got it. The next question, will we have a choice as to which vaccine to get? I understand that Johnson Johnson is about 66% effective. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just say right now, we only have two that are FDA approved and CDC recommended. And those are Pfizer and Moderna. I went to the uh, clinic hoping I would get Moderna. Um, but I got there and I got Pfizer because I heard that Moderna would have less side effects, especially with the second dose. And I must just say everyone I hear that have gotten Pfizer will get, you know, the fever and the chills and all those things and just the muscle aches. But when I got the Pfizer um, uh, vaccine, I was just so glad to get something because I'm tired of living in fear. I want to see my folks. I want to be able to travel. Um, so I can't wait to get that number two dose on my travel CDC card because uh, we're going to need that to really travel. Uh, we now see even in the U.S., if you travel outside the U.S., even U.S. citizens now, as of about two weeks ago, have to have a negative COVID test from the last, I think, 72 hours, even when you travel outside the country. So if you start to see now what's happening, you're going to need that. All right, next question. I've been trying to get my family signed up for the vaccine, but the websites are quite complicated. What advice could you give to those who need help getting an appointment? Yes, now that is a tough question because you have to deal with all 50 states and territories. There is, there, there was no national plan. Um, and let me just say this, there is a national plan now. Um, I tell people all the time, I hear this, now, there are always going to be at the end of every day vaccines that are left over. We heard the stories of vaccines going to waste. What we do now, and I've heard stories from folks that have gone to CVS around, let's say, 2.30, 3 o'clock, put your name on the list and wait. Because what you're finding now is whether it's um, a pharmacy or a health department or a clinic or hospital, they're not going to waste. And I'll say my church, um, I go to a church, Reed Temple AME in, um, in, um, in Maryland. And we started the first vaccine clinic in Prince George's County um, um, and in a community clinic, I should say. And just this past Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, um, we always had some left over or we would advocate to the, uh, the, to the clinic um, workers to just give us some more because we had lines that were stretched all the way out. We had a 91 year old lady who was just thankful that she could come and get her vaccine. But I say this, um, I, I felt like Harriet Tubman because at the end of the day, I was just calling people. Can you get here in 10 minutes? So I say this, advocate for yourselves, advocate for your family members. I've heard the stories. I've had my godmother that was just waiting. Um, my, my aunt is still waiting. Um, and they're above that age and they want their vaccines, but we're having some issues with it on a state by state level. But all I say is put your name on the list, help those folks that are seniors that don't know how to do it, do it for them, check the emails because when those emails come in, it may go to spam, it may go to clutter, but also I say go to your pharmacies and I'm not going to say stand there, but if you have to go back every day, you do it. All right. AstraZeneca is coming out with a vaccine that will be one dose and not need the extreme cold temps that the current two vaccines have. What is the expected efficacy, if you know, of AstraZeneca? Um, and has it been developed using traditional vaccine methods? So this is the thing about that. Uh, yes, it's been used with traditional uh, vaccine methods. And so this is going to be unlike uh, the mRNA uh, that we um, talked about earlier. But again, um, I think the plus again is that it's going to be one that is going to be, like you said, it doesn't need to be refrigerated and all of that. And it's going to be useful in some societies. Uh, now, when is it going to be available here? Um, we just don't know yet when it's going to be available here. Hopefully within, let's say, the next several weeks, 
that it will be approved. I know the government is already looking at uh, doing um, uh, basically studies and all of that for individuals that are um, um, that are wanting it. And, and so you're gonna see eventually that it will receive an emergency use authorization. Uh, but then we need to really look at the efficacy because the efficacy is much lower um, and uh, much lower. And so again, I think we have to make sure in the, I wouldn't wait for just that for us as African-Americans, because again, what we're telling everybody, get whatever it is, use whatever it is. Now, I do caution this one thing. Um, if you get Pfizer, your first dose, you have to stick with Pfizer for your second dose. If you stick get Moderna for your first one, you have to get Moderna for your second dose. Now, we have seen some studies in the past, but not yet, where you would take one, um, one brand and then you get another one and it's actually better, but we haven't had those studies yet. And so I say, uh, we have to wait and see. So until I get it in black and white and I read the studies and to see what's going on, then we'll make a decision at that time. Cool. And all the questions seem to be about COVID. So the next one, should I take Tylenol before my first vaccine? Um, I think before your first vaccine, you're okay. Um, but I'll just say, if you start feeling some symptoms, then do it. Now, now you heard me say um, on my second dose, I'm going to take it. Um, but uh, for the first dose, all you're really going to feel is some arm pain. Um, and that's just, and the needle is small. I was expect, I don't like needles. I don't mind sticking people, but I don't like needles. The needle is so small. You can say, is that it? When I went with my godmother to get her, she was like, am I done? So the thing is, just don't sleep on your arm because you're going to feel it the next day. You may not feel it all the first day, but you will feel it uh, the next day. Got it. Have there been any studies done between the vaccine and blood thinner drugs, for example, warfarin? Yeah, um, I have not seen any myself. Uh, now, what we're gonna probably start seeing are some reports because now that we are uh, vaccinating hundreds of thousands of folks and hopefully millions of folks, we're gonna start seeing more things. Uh, now, uh, do I believe that there's gonna be an issue with blood thinners? and um, vaccines, I don't see an association with that. Um, not to say that there's not one, but again, we haven't seen any bleeding as a result of the vaccines. Great, thank you for that. Uh, without longer term studies on the effects of the vaccines, how can medical researchers conclusively state that the COVID vaccines are safe and without side effects? Yeah, so again, we know that there are side effects. Um, there are side effects in the initial phase. Because we've been studying this for more than um, um, 20 years, I'll say that the science is behind us with this. The science is really behind us with the technology. And again, we're not using live vaccines like we did when we were um, uh, younger. Um, and again, this is just the particles or the coating of a virus um, and it's just making your body react to it. You got your T cells and your B cells and all those things and it just allows it to recognize it. So um, I really would not um, you know, worry too much um, about it, but I think, um, I think we're on the right path uh, with this. But what we're seeing is even though we may look at the numbers as being small in the studies, we now have vaccinated many more folks. And so when there are adverse issues, those are reported to the Food and Drug Administration. And you know, those things are done and we're gonna see even more. So I, I look, I'm not gonna say, I look at this as like a, almost like a study in progress, but to be honest, um, I, I think that we're gonna see some positive things coming out of this um, because if we don't do anything, then we're gonna continue to die. And um, right now, we got to get ahead of the variants that are coming. And so that's really the reason why you're seeing um, all this action taking place now, because we're trying to get ahead of it um, as, a, um, as the United States, um, because we have to, we, we've been slow in our delivery, but now we have to really get behind, um, get in front of this disease. And the only way to do it is to vaccinate everyone. Um, you've seen some folks have, have talked about 
let's just give everybody the first vaccine because we want to get something in them. Um, let me give you a story as well. My aunt called me, she works in North Carolina um, and she uh, called me up one day, her and a colleague, and they were debating whether they were gonna get the vaccine. And so um, I sat there and talked to them. I was driving and I talked to them for about 15 minutes and I convinced them to get the vaccine. They went the next day and got their vaccine. About three weeks ago, my aunt called me up on a Thursday. She was like, um, one of her good friends in North Carolina just wasn't feeling well because her son, her only son died in October. So they were thinking, okay, she's depressed. Um, my aunt goes to the house and, um, and uh, convinces her to go to the emergency room. She gets to the emergency room. Her blood glucose is over 600. It's off the chart. 600 was the most they can um, check. Um, and then, so about three hours later, my aunt gets a call. She was COVID positive. Now, you know, that would scare anybody. So when you're doing a good job um, or good, being a good Samaritan, you can put yourself in situations. But remember, she went to her house, helped her get dressed, put her in the car, sat with her in the emergency room. And when my aunt, she couldn't get the rapid test, um, anytime that day or the next few days, she got it on that Monday. And do you know her COVID, her COVID test came back negative. So that's why I tell people at least get the, go ahead and get the vaccination because if you have underlying conditions, you just never know that one shot can actually help you and save you. Even if it's 76 to 84% effective with that one shot. So go ahead and get those vaccinations because that's a testimony in itself because it could have been my aunt that called me saying her test was positive. Uh, so I encourage everyone to really do that. All right, and we have just a few more minutes. So I'll take a, just a few more questions, but um, is Moderna or Pfizer better? And it, does it matter if you're a public non-healthcare worker? So is Moderna or Pfizer better? They're equally effective. Effective. Um, so um, if you do Pfizer, then you're going to, you will get your next dose in 21 days. If you do Moderna, your next dose is going to be in 28 days. That's the only difference that we see besides 0.9% difference between uh, Pfizer at 95 and Moderna at 94.1% effective. Um, they both work from the same technology and both are equally effective. All right, has there been any research or data about how the vaccine can affect those with underlying medical conditions, specifically autoimmune disorders? Yeah, um, you know, that has come up before. And again, what we've told folks is that um, because of your underlying condition and because they're immunocompromised, the recommendation is to get the vaccine because if you have all this virus out here and you're already susceptible, you don't, unless you're gonna stay uh, in 100% of the time and don't have any visitors, that's one thing. But if you're going in and out of your house and being around folks, then you have to be mindful that any uh, underlying condition, you really need to have um, that vaccine. All right, let's take a couple more questions. Is your position that people will not contract COVID once they receive the vaccine. So it's possible to have COVID after um, the vaccine. Now, so remember five to 6% can have, um, can, uh, can possibly get the uh, COVID-19. And what we're saying is this, the vaccine is good for at least three months. So what we're seeing is some folks who have had COVID are getting reinfected with COVID. Some people that have had the vaccine is getting COVID because there's still that period. You need to have the vaccine for about two weeks in your body before you have full recovery uh, or at least full um, effect on it as well. So those are the things that you have to like keep in mind as well. All right, and then... What made this vaccine different from other diseases which still don't have a vaccine like HIV? Yeah, uh, so this is um, an RNA virus. Um, and again, RNA viruses do mutate. 
Um, we know that um, whether it was coming out of Wuhan, China, uh, we know that um, it more than likely came from an animal to a human, which we always see with a lot of viruses. Um, but the difference is, again, with, um, our, with um, um, HIV, it's just a different pathway uh, that we're looking at. But again, I go back to say, um, when we're looking at, um, and I spoke to the leaders of the um, bio, National Virology Lab um, at uh, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease, uh, the one thing about it is that, um, again, this has been studied for a long time. And again, um, some people say a sister um, actually discovered it. And I'll say, yes, I think her name is Kometa. Yes, she, she was on the team. And however, um, the leader of that, um, uh, the director of that office, actually, because I interviewed him just uh, yesterday and the show is going to be aired on, um, sun, on Saturday. Um, he's actually married to a black woman. So, um, you know, so uh, that's, and so what I'm saying is, and, you know, and they're out here advocating for us. So we have people who are in places of power that have developed this technology. And because of that, let's trust them, let's have faith, and let's, again, think about uh, making sure that we get vaccinated. And even when get, getting vaccinated, we need to make sure we still wear our masks. We still wear our, um, um, wash our hands uh, and we still social distance, um, still that self isolation and all those things. We have to do that. But I'll just say from what we're seeing, we're dealing with so many things. Our kids are suffering. Our seniors are suffering. Um, we're seeing suicide uh, increase. It was already increasing in the black community. We're seeing suicide increase. There was one school system that had 19 suicides alone in teens. Uh, we're seeing partner violence, domestic violence, increased um, um, alcohol use, increased drug use. Um, all those things are occurring. We have to get back to a place of normalcy. We have to get back to schools. We have to open up our economy. Um, we have to, our seniors, are di uh, people are dying and you cannot even go to visit them. Uh, we have to have um, um, celebrations of life or funerals. Uh, with 25 people, when people may have impacted thousands of folks. And just imagine the psychological um, 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 behavior um, behind all that, or as a result of that, we have some folks that are going to be um, uh, dealing with this for years to come. We need everybody in our community to come together and to really think about how can we as a people come to really combat this. Um, and I know we can do it. Um, and I believe it was um, uh, Nelson Mandela that said, um, um, nothing is impossible until it's done, until it happens. And I know that we can make it happen. Cool, we'll take just one more question and then I'll turn it over to the wonderful Paula Fontana to wrap up our session for this evening. Um, is the window between the first and second shot specific or just a minimum? Do you have to get it exactly 21 days later in the case of Pfizer? No, you don't. And so I'll say this, um, what we're saying is this, uh, that's the recommendation and that's what your clinics are pushing for. When you get, the longer you go, um, and, um, and we'll tell you this sometimes, the longer you go between your vaccinations, the better. What you want to do is for your body to respond to the first one and then it can respond to the second one as well. Now, I'm not saying that the closer you get it, the more likely you are to have the symptoms. Um, but what I will say is this, um, your body still needs to rest and to recognize it. However, right now, we know that, you know, studies have been, you know, the 21 days follow up and the 28 days and all those things. But, um, but you can go really six weeks, um, really. And, and I've seen those recommendations. But I say, do what your doctor says. Let's get vaccinated um, and let's combat this. And if you like me, I'm ready to get on the airplane. I'm ready to travel. I want to go to the Dominican Republic. Yeah. No, I want to go. I want to go to Greece. I want to go places that I've turned down before. But let me tell you, I'm tired of being isolated. I'm ready to go out and have a good time. And if you say go, I'm, I'm gonna say when. <laughs> Dr. Bazell, thank you so much for sharing this incredible information with us. I mean, it was 
so timely. So again, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Paula. Sure. And Lamar, thank you for sharing your series with us on a national level. We definitely appreciate that. And if you are listening in and you're in the DC area, I highly recommend you reach out to the DC chapter and become a member. If you are already a member, definitely get involved. So hopefully you've seen the chat and you have seen that there is a survey. The first 25 people to fill out that survey you will be entered to win an Amazon gift card. So you wanna make sure that you fill out that survey and tell us how we did this evening and what types of programs really resonate with you. Until then, take care of yourself, mind, body, and soul, and we'll see you next time. Good night.